Good afternoon, everyone. Joining me today is Eliza Kibogo, the regional CIO of Sunbeak Bank. We are going to talk about what it means to be a CIO, and then you're going to find out if he actually has fun when he isn't working and what he does with his kids over the holidays. And uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy this, so welcome. So I'll just get right to it. When you're thinking about buying tech, what do you usually consider? What options do you weigh? Uh, take on a personal side or work side? Work side. Yeah, work side. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, well, it depends on what the business needs are. So we essentially, from a technology world, we try never to dictate. Mm -hmm. So we listen to what the business need is mm -hmm. and then understand what they truly are looking at. Mm -hmm. Are they looking? I mean, obviously, uh, you have to start the conversation from hardware, software, ETC, mm -hmm. understand what the problem is. Because many times you'll find that people think they have a technology need, but in reality, they could be a business process issue. Mm -hmm. So you kind of guide them and understand, and then you weigh that. But as soon as you understand what the business need is, mm -hmm. then you can make the right uh, decisions in collaboration with your with your business colleagues. Okay. But the idea is to listen and listen carefully, understand the business that you're in. It doesn't matter whether it's banking, financial world, or whatever, but you must understand what the business you're in. Mm -hmm. uh, the technology is not as important as what you're trying to achieve. Okay. So how do you get buy-in? How do you get everyone to collaborate with this idea? So what you're talking about, I think, is what I would call stakeholder management because that's what buy-in is. Let's assume I'm also trying to sell something, not just from a business perspective, but something that I want from a technology, pure technology perspective. So it's important for a technology leader, be be they a CIO, a regional CIO, whatever, that they are, they are able to manage their stakeholders, especially when you're working for a multinational bank, mm -hmm. as, as I do. Uh, you're not only working with one country, but several countries or people from, from uh, the head office, etc. You must manage your stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So the buy-in is extremely important because you can't quite impose things on people, mm -hmm. as it were. So is, are the needs different when you look at it regionally? Like, do we need something different from Uganda or from Tanzania? So, so that's a very important question, Carol, and thank you for that question, because it depends completely on the, on the, on the, on the country that you're dealing with. Uh, for example, I, I deal with six countries, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, a bit of South Sudan, a bit of Ethiopia, actually a bit more than the six countries, mm -hmm. and also Malawi, Zambia, and, and uh, one Portuguese-speaking country, which is Mozambique. So to your, to your question, it truly does depend because it could be a language issue. Mm -hmm. It could be, it could be uh, just, just the fact that in East Africa, maybe we have a bit of commonality, mm -hmm. uh, the three countries. But even the nuances between Kenya and Uganda, or Kenya and South Sudan, or Kenya and Tanzania, it, it's, uh, it could be a bit different. Mm -hmm. So even in Kenya itself, when you have nuances between Nairobi and, and Mombasa, it's completely different. The needs could be uh, completely different. But if I could take a step back and answer a question that I think may be out there, the way we are structured at the regional level is we have Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and then the other countries that I mentioned, which is Malawi, Zambia, and uh, Mozambique. But we also run several countries out of, uh, from a technology pers perspective. We support them out of Kenya. So we do support South Sudan, which we have a fairly big uh, operation there. We do support Ethiopia and we do support Rwanda from here. Rwanda is a one-man operation. Uh, Ethiopia is a two-man operation, actually two-lady operation, I would say. So, but uh, the South Sudan operation is quite large. We have about 50 people there. We have several branches, uh, but all of that is supported from the Kenyan office. So whenever we say Kenya internally, we mean those other three countries as well. Have you ever had a project that went across the board? Yes, we have many projects that go across the board outside of my region as well. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout Africa, we, we, do, we operate in 17, 18 countries. So we do have, especially on the corporate and investment banking side of the business, mm -hmm. most of our applications or systems are across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, we have common systems. Uh, like our core banking system, we do not systems, we don't have common systems across, across the, the bank. We have three or four that we, we use. Uh, throughout. So we, we do have, like in Kenya, we use T24 as an example. In Angola and Mozambique, we also use T24. And the rest of the countries outside of South Africa, we use Finacol. And in South Africa, we use SAP as, as, as it were. But however, many of our systems, to go back to your question, are used across the bank, mm -hmm. deployed, out, deployed once to many. Okay. So what do you think are the technical skills that a CIO needs most? Um, 
believe it or not, actually at the top of my list, and I hear your question, so I'll avoid your question and then come back. <laughs> at the top of my, 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 my uh, the skills that you would need as a CIO is really communication, coordinating, stakeholder management, things like that. Mm -hmm. The tech, uh, Obviously, you do need technical skills. Mm -hmm. And what technical skills are those? I wouldn't say they should be in-depth, like my son. My son has more technical skills than I have. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, however, does not have that many uh, communication skills as such. Mm -hmm. His way of communicating is running away and going to his room, etc. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so from a technical perspective, it needs to be broad. You need to have worked in various uh, departments mm -hmm. as, as you're coming up. Mm -hmm. So as an example, uh, at the very beginning of my career, which is 35 years ago, maybe or so, I did a little bit of COBOL development, if mm -hmm. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's ancient programming as it were. So, I did that, then went into project management, then I went into various uh, fields of, uh, of technology. So as, as long as you can pick those up along the way, it really does serve you. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my biggest handicaps is that I've never worked in security. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those areas that I know it's a handicap for me, mm -hmm. but then I do know that I need to rely on others, but also be able to, uh, to say when I don't know and be able to acquire that knowledge. Mm -hmm. But it's important that as people grow up and aspire to become CIOs, mm -hmm they need to understand that they need to work in a variety of different areas within technology. So that way you can carry that with you. But also never forget the soft skills. And that's what I was emphasizing earlier on. The communication, the coordination, the leadership, mm -hmm. things like that. So if you're looking at the soft skills, you're looking at technical skills, you're looking at interpersonal skills, mm -hmm. are we asking too much of the CIO? Oh, absolutely. I, I strongly believe that, especially when you're running at uh, the country level as it were. Mm -hmm. The regional level is slightly different because my role is to really coordinate, uh, guide, mentor, mm -hmm. coach, etc. But at the country level, and I'm talking about now multinational, when you are dealing at, uh, at the hands-on, I would say hands-on level, mm -hmm. We sometimes do ask too much of our CIOs, but it's up to you as a CIO to be clever and understand what your weaknesses are mm -hmm. and what your strengths are. Mm -hmm. So that way you hire people who have the direct opposite of that. For example, if you do realize that you're not the greatest communicator, but you have uh, excellent technical skills, then make sure that one or two of people in the leadership team mm -hmm. do have strong communication skills. Mm -hmm. Or if uh, the opposite is true, if you're not very skilled at some level, like I mentioned, I uh, have very little security background. So I made sure that the people that I surrounded myself have strong security security knowledge, because you, you do need that. Yes, so uh, to answer directly your question, yes, we are asking too much of the CIO. However, it is up to the CIO to make sure they surround themselves with the right caliber of people mm -hmm. and the right skills, especially knowing what your strengths are and your weaknesses and higher against that. Okay. So there was a time there was a story about um, a hacking incident between Airtel, MTN, Stanbic and Bank of Africa. What exactly happened and how did you deal with it? Okay. And I'm assuming you're talking about the incident in Uganda? Yes. Is that, is that what you're talking yeah. about? Okay. No, that, that was quite unfortunate, but unfortunately, uh, uh, the weakness just happened to be in, in our aggregator mm -hmm. at, at the time, uh, and, and, and that's who was hacked. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so in other words, the aggregator was hacked, mm -hmm. and then in addition to that, then obviously MTN also was hit, Airtel was mm -hmm. hit to some certain extent, mm -hmm. and also ourselves. Mm -hmm. How did we deal with it? We made sure we took, uh, we, we quickly realized what was happening, and then took proactive measures to shut down and then start monitoring and make sure that it didn't continue over the weekend through, or throughout the weekend mm -hmm. as such. But it's, it's one of those things that you, you do have to be um, very proactive and you do have to ascertain that you are up and up, as it were, on, on uh, ensuring that you cover yourself, etc. Mm -hmm. But in some instances, unfortunately, uh, the hackers actually either have uh, some insider knowledge, mm -hmm. as they did with, uh, with, with uh, some of our vendors, etc. Mm -hmm. So it was unfortunate, but we, we dealt with it and we've, we've made sure we've covered our bases, as it were. How do you handle legacy tech? Uh, very interesting question. Le legacy tech has, has been... Um, has been a problem and especially I'll take you back to even when we were moving from uh, 1999 to, to 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, legacy tech was at the, at the root of that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, Y2K, yeah, I think that's what we used to call it. So, so legacy tech unfortunately can't go away as quickly. It's how you manage it. Mm -hmm. So your direct question was how do we handle legacy tech? Mm -hmm. It's by ensuring that you have a good strategic plan to ensure that you're actually able to 
to remove it as you go along. Mm -hmm. But you can't necessarily remove it as quickly as, as we would like to. Mm -hmm. uh, because some of the systems that we have in, our, in, 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 in the bank, or even in any other place I've worked in, is about 50 years old, all the way from the late 60s, early 70s, when technology came around. Now, how you deal with that mm -hmm. is important. But make sure that you have a good plan, maybe a five-year plan, knowing that you need to remove some of that old technology mm -hmm. from back in the day. Okay. Yeah. So is banking innovative? Because I'm thinking that it's a bit like the Catholic Church before the new pope. So do you actually have any moments when you think that you're innovative or do you feel like regulation actually stops you from being innovative as a bank? So, so um, we're one of the most heavily regulated industries. Mm -hmm. But however, that should not be an excuse mm -hmm. for not being innovative. Because innovation does not necessarily come through technology as such, alone, but it's even in your mindset, in the way you then start questioning yourself, why do we do uh, the couple of, you know, two or three things that you do in the bank? Just because it's been done in the past doesn't mean that you have to continue doing it in the future. Because you'll find that just because somebody has been signing this piece of paper or has been asking the customer, our client, to sign a piece of paper so that that way they can check their balance. It doesn't necessarily mean that you continue doing that. So you need to be innovative. The CBK or any other regulator would tell you not to do that. It's an issue of sometimes this institutional legacy that has crept up and then you are not able to innovate as quickly as you can. Uh, admittedly, banks are not, uh, they're not as uh, fast moving as uh, the, the, some of our other competitors, as it were, and by competitors, I mean, I mean especially the MTNs, the Safaricoms, ETC. Uh, but however, we are quickly catching up, otherwise uh, we'll lose our lunch, as it were. Yeah. So when you're looking at the rise of fintechs and you're looking at banking, mm -hmm. how is it that you're able to bridge the gap between yourself and the consumers without them feeling like they are falling out of place or like they're not important, especially since you have you have the generation that believes in banking, then you have the millennials who believe in fintech. How do you reconcile that? Um, so so that's, that's the, the challenge of the century, as it were. Mm -hmm. let, let me put it that way. But, but it's also that we are waking up or have already woken up to that. In the last four or five years, you clearly see profits of uh, fintechs, as it were, mm -hmm. uh, go up. Well, our, uh, our, our, I would say we are plateauing, as, as, as it were. So however, you then say, how do I then challenge myself to ensure that I don't continue to plateau or maybe even to decline? Mm -hmm. So, and uh, clearly banks have woken up to that. However, the leading banks in Kenya, in East Africa, in Africa, have uh, stood up to the challenge and have actually decided we are going to run like a fintech. Many, many banks in our days are actually quite innovative. Uh, the, the products we're coming with to the table and listening to our customers. A long time ago, as you, you may know, mm -hmm. is that banks used to operate from nine to three. And now these banks don't do that. Yeah. Uh, you had to get a letter from your chief, I think, in the old days, and I'm, now I'm telling you <laughs> how old I am. Uh, to open an account, you had to get a letter from your chief mm -hmm. to come and open an account. Clearly, we've understood that that's not the way to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, ladies could not uh, open an account unless they were either co-signed by their husbands or whatever. That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So we've moved away from that legacy, mm -hmm. late 70s, early 80s, uh, towards whereby now we are as quick in opening accounts as the fintechs are. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and making sure that we don't have, but also making sure that we know our customers. Obviously, we don't want to open up accounts to, for people who should not be opening up accounts in new institutions, mm -hmm. which is where our strength lies. Mm -hmm. So in as much as fintechs have been flexible, in as much as we protect the government, the people, whatever, we do a much better job, if you ask me, in knowing who our customers are. Mm -hmm. So that way, it's called KYC. When the regulator comes to us, it's easy for us to, mm -hmm. to be able to communicate to the regulator or the government in case, you know, we obviously have the terrorism issue in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So we make sure that money doesn't flow through uh, or people opening up accounts that they shouldn't. So you manage CIOs and you are a CIO. So what are the qualities that you think someone needs to become a CIO? Okay. So um, I am a regional CIO mm -hmm. and I was a CIO in Kenya, Mozambique, uh, Angola, etc. Uh, and some of the qualities one needs is the ability to juggle, especially that, to juggle different things and not to feel pressure, uh, too much pressure when you're under fire, when the systems go down or when they, there's a hacking incident like you mentioned earlier. So especially that, the, the ability to handle many things at the same time, uh, the ability to handle pressure well, 
uh, the fact that you'll get phone calls late at night, early in the morning, etc. One has to be able to, to, to be able to, to be dynamic and to be able to keep up with what's happening. Because if you don't keep up, uh, you'll find that the young people will come and talk to you in language that you may not understand. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to read, you need to be able to uh, relax as well, and be able to manage and guide your people. So it's, it's, it's a cross-section of abilities that you need to have. But I think, most importantly, is the ability to be able to juggle. So what are some of the projects that you're working on? What do they involve when it comes to new technology? What is it? Like, do you use AI? How do you handle big data? What are you working on? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So one of the biggest areas, actually it's three or four big areas that we are, I would say, I would consider we are leading in, uh, especially in the data, data mining, data, data field. We're using, we are, we, are, we are hiring a lot of data scientists. We are also making sure that we understand how do we then collect this data and use it cleverly. Because it's one thing to collect the data and it's there another thing to say, what are we going to do with this data? Obviously we, we are collecting the data for a good reason, to be able to grow our business, etc., to understand our clients, to fulfill better service to our clients, etc. So that's that's one. The data field is actually a growing field, and I would encourage young people who are out there listening to actually get into that field. So the other one is um, cloud, migrating to cloud. Uh, it's a conversation that we've had across the board, uh, but we've made quite good strides, actually, especially in Kenya, to be able to migrate some of our systems to the cloud, move away from the data center. We have about a two or three uh, plan that will actually succeed in moving us away from physical data centers based here and uh, away into, into the cloud as it were. But again, then we need to make sure that we are communicating with our regulators, making sure they understand what we are trying to achieve so that we, uh, it's not perceived that we are migrating our cloud, uh, I mean our data, our customer data mm -hmm. somewhere else. So, those are the two main areas, uh, data plus the cloud conversation, plus AI as you, as, as, as you talk about. Artificial intelligence is, 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 is key to the future. So we are doubling in it at the present moment, but also understanding how do we then use that uh, to make sure that we provide innovative uh, products and technologies to our customers, to our business, etc. What is it that you like about your job? Um, the challenges that come with it, uh, especially... You like the challenges? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I love the challenges that come along with it. Uh, clearly, uh, the challenges are then there to be solved and to be, uh, to, to, to be, uh, to be completed or as such. And once, once you solve a challenge, I mean, it's a, it's a really good, good feeling. What else do I like about my job? It's the fact that I can actually coach and mentor younger CIOs mm -hmm. to be able to actually uh, get to where they want to get to. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and I also find the fact that I'm not dealing with just one country, uh, again, speaks to challenges. I'm dealing with different markets, uh, different uh, countries, different dynamics, etc. It, it's, it gives me more, more of a fulfillment on a personal basis. So when you have on one hand you have data, then on the other hand you have data privacy, and then you have people who want to make sure their data is safe, yeah. because this is a conversation that's happening right now. Yes. How do you handle data privacy as Tanbik? Um, I wouldn't say we, quote unquote, handle it as standard because they obviously the government has provided guidelines mm -hmm. and there's some expectations from the regulator. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we do is make sure we adhere to that. We also adhere to, to global standards, as mm -hmm. it were. European Union has some standards. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the Americans have some, some uh, different standards, ETC. Mm -hmm. So you look at those standards and actually lift up your game to beat all those standards, as mm -hmm. it were. Mm -hmm. Because the last thing you want is to... Uh, run afoul of any of the above because mm -hmm. you, you want to make sure that people have a strong belief in what you're doing mm -hmm. and the fact that their data is uh, is safe with you mm -hmm. because ma many of our clients, I mean, nobody would want their bank balances known throughout as, a, as an example mm -hmm. or what you, your transactions ETC. So, so we, we do uh, adhere to the standards that are laid down by the various uh, uh, regulators uh, mm -hmm. in the different regions that we operate in and, and then live up and beyond that, as it mm. were. Yes. Okay. So where do you see the industry in another three to five years, if at all you can forecast that far? Uh, the, the good thing, we've been challenged by the fintechs, as we talked about, and now we are stepping up to the challenge. The truth of the matter is there are some, uh, some of the people who don't step up to that in innovation, as it were, 
who don't who don't uh, step up to the challenge mm -hmm. you know the expectations of the younger generation the millenniums etc mm -hmm. uh, they they don't want to walk into a bank they just want to deal on mobile app mm -hmm. uh, they want to be able to open their accounts online etc but then alternatively on the flip side of that is we also have customers who want to come to the bank for a personal touch mm -hmm. so the thing is we are ready for that mm -hmm. but we're also now ready for 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 the younger ones that don't mm -hmm. ever want to come and see us mm -hmm. which is fine but now where do i see uh, uh three three years five years from now what, what's happening you have to be able to juggle the two mm -hmm. to say okay i have these young ones that want clearly to deal with us electronically and we are ready for that mm -hmm. and i then i have people like myself who occasionally want to come in and share a cup of coffee mm -hmm. and talk to the branch manager or whatever and be able to transact but most predominantly most people actually do their banking online so you have all these consumers who are very savvy and they have a lot of questions and they need answers. How do you create an experience for them as a bank? Going back to innovation. The, the, the experience must be seamless all the way from the day they open the account to the day they want to engage with you either through a, f a facility. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be seamless. You can't have excuses. I'll, I'll give you an example. Most people when they open up their phones and uh, look at Google, they always it's always up as it were. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. That's the same challenge that we have when you when you look at Facebook, etc. Yes, occasionally even those systems do go down, but uh, anymore our customers, our clients, do not expect us to be down. So we have to step up and make sure that we have redundancy in our systems. Our systems are secure. Their data is secure, etc. I, I found this article on the website that talked about a stand big meeting with Chinese fintech. Mm -hmm. How did that go, and what is how does it benefit the consumer? Okay. Um, Maybe just a bit of background on uh, our involvement uh, mm -hmm. with, with the uh, Chinese world as it were. So Standard Bank South Africa, which is uh, the main shareholder of mm -hmm. Standard Bank Kenya, for example, mm -hmm. is actually 20% owned by uh, IBC, I, 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 ICBC. And ICBC uh, is, is one of the biggest banks in the world. I, I think as a matter of fact it is. It's a Chinese bank. So. So you find that we do collaborate a lot with our Chinese colleagues, our mm -hmm. Chinese. Uh, uh, so we have a lot of, obviously, we have a lot of Chinese businessmen, Chinese government working in Kenya, working in Zambia, working in, uh, across Africa. So, mm -hmm. so we do engage with the fintechs in China. We do engage with a lot of, uh, uh, we have a lot of clients that are Chinese, etc. So there's a lot of collaboration between us and them. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. So what, how does the consumer benefit from this collaboration? Yeah. Yeah. So it's the products that we bring to the table. I mean, the products don't necessarily have to be Chinese-centric. Mm -hmm. They can be used. Uh, the technology that's coming out of China is actually quite quite advanced. Mm -hmm. So we use some of that uh, technology to be able to, to, to innovate with the new products that we are bringing to the market. Okay. Yeah. So where do you see the banking industry going in 2021? Um, either you innovate or you die. <laughs> it's, it's that simple. The fintechs are clearly uh, awake and they've... Uh, uh, they've understood what mm -hmm. the millennium need. Actually, not just the millennium. Even some of the some of the people who are paying, uh, for example, paying paying their employees, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quicker sometimes to to transact through the fintechs, etc. So we then need to be as quick, if not quicker. And we've understood that, and and we need to be to be as innovative, if not more innovative. Okay. Yeah. So that's where we're going. If we don't innovate, we are we're done for. Okay, so what have you noticed yeah. that has changed about you from the moment you were first appointed CIO mm -hmm. to now? I've got more grey hair. <laughs> That's one, for sure. <laughs> uh, no. Um, so, I, I would say I listen more because if you don't listen, you won't understand what you're being told. You need to be quiet before and understand the issue that is being presented to you. I do listen a bit more. Uh, before, I used to be most uh, outspoken. I would speak before I had the person so understand what you're being told so that way uh, you you then grasp the nature of the problem mm -hmm. uh, that honestly uh, in the last 10 years or so i've grown because of my role as a cio okay thank you thank you and well everybody that's it you have it you've heard from uh, elijah kibogo if you have any questions for him you can pass them through me then i can ask him then you can see what we get so thank you so much for being here